In November 1597, Toyotomi Hideyoshi ordered his armies in Korea to withdraw back to the south. They have fulfilled his command to punish the Koreans, killing many thousands. And he doesn't want to get into a costly war with the Chinese, who are now mobilizing a massive army. In this episode, we're going to see what happens next, as an allied Chinese and Korean army of 50,000 converges on the Japanese fortress chain in the south. As always, before we get going, please hit that subscribe button to support my channel. And give this video a thumbs up if you think it deserves it. Thanks. The Japanese perimeter around Pusan in the closing days of 1597 is significantly longer than in previous years. It now stretches all the way from the port of Ulsan in the east to Sunshon on the border of Chola province in the west, a total of 14 forts spreading over 200 kilometers of coastline. Konishi Yukinaga is anchoring the western end at Sunshon. His rival, Katokio Masa is at Ulsan at the opposite end. Kato arrived at Ulsan in December 1597 after burning the town of Kyongju and the temple complex of Bulguksa on his southward withdrawal. He garrisons the port of Ulsan itself and then sets to work building a fortress atop a nearby hill called Tosan. With a large Chinese army now on its way south, it's a race for Kato's men to get this fortress built. They work around the clock alongside Korean slaves, denuding the surrounding country of trees and erecting the logs into walls and emplacements. They need to hurry because the Chinese are already probing south. A vanguard unit under Ming Commander-in-Chief Ma Gui arrives at Chunju on November 23rd to find the Japanese gone. He pushes on to Namwon, where General Yang Yuan had suffered such a terrible defeat. He finds it too abandoned. Dead bodies are piled up like mountains, Ma writes in his report, and not a house is left standing. Back in the north, meanwhile, a large Ming army of 40,000 men is gathering. It arrives in Seoul in early December and continues south to join forces with the Korean army, 10,000 men under Commander-in-Chief Guan Yul. This combined Chinese and Korean force, a total of 50,000 men, then starts moving east toward Ulsan. The Chinese think that Ulsan is the weakest link in the Japanese chain. This is therefore where they will strike. The Allied army arrives at Ulsan on January 29, 1598, and overwhelms the Japanese garrison holding the port. 500 Japanese are killed in this fight. The rest fall back to the nearby hilltop fortress at Tosan that Kato Kiyomasa's men have been frantically trying to complete. They haven't quite succeeded. At least one of the gates in the outer wall isn't finished leaving a big hole in the defenses. The Chinese and Koreans quickly spot this weakness and attack here the following day, flooding into the fort and seizing most of Kato's supplies. But the Japanese have prepared for this. They've built an inner fortress inside the walls. They fall back into it now and fend off the ferocious attack that follows, inflicting heavy casualties on the Allied army. The assault is finally called off and Tosan is placed under siege. Kato Kiyomasa and his men, numbering less than 10,000, are now in a desperate situation. 
They are vastly outnumbered, at least six to one. The enemy has captured their supplies, so they have little water and almost no food. And there's little wood for fires. They're freezing. Kato now makes a crucial decision. He reserves the bulk of his remaining food and water for his most effective fighting men, his musketeers, and leaves the rest to largely fend for themselves. As the siege of Tosan drags on through February, more and more Japanese start sneaking out of the fort at night to look for water and to scavenge for food from the frozen bodies outside. Korean army commander Kim Ung so would report capturing as many as 100 in one night. Most were too weak to fight and were glad to surrender, if only to get a sip of water and something to eat. Further along the Japanese fortress chain, other garrisons, in the meantime, are trying to come to the aid of the defenders at Tosan. Squadrons of Japanese ships move east and up the Tehua River, south of the fort, forcing the Chinese to relocate some of their cannons to drive them off. Japanese army units from outlying fortresses are also pressing in closer. They didn't try to attack the numerically superior Chinese-Korean army, but instead made a show of their presence by placing banners and flags atop the hills around Tosan, adding pressure on the Chinese to lift the siege. This steady build-up of pressure had its effect. The Chinese supreme commander, Yang Hao, began to grow uneasy. Another factor weighing on him was that his army also was suffering. Obtaining enough food to feed 50,000 men and a vast number of horses in the middle of winter was a serious problem. During just the first week of the siege, a thousand horses collapsed and died. By the middle of February, Yang Hao had come to the conclusion that he could not continue. He either had to take Tosan right away or withdraw. He decided to take the fortress. On February 19, 1598, starting at dawn, Chinese and Korean troops launched a final all-out assault. It lasted for three hours. When it was over, 500 bodies lay in heaps at the base of the walls, and the Japanese remained unbeaten inside. Tosan hadn't been taken. Yang Hao, deciding that he could not continue, lifted the siege. As his troops began to withdraw, and confusion reigned, for the Koreans hadn't been given the withdrawal order, Japanese troops aboard ships on the Tehua River began storming ashore. The Chinese and Korean withdrawal turned into an undisciplined retreat all the way north to Kyongju. Back at Tosan, the defenders were beginning to emerge from their fort. Of Kato's original contingent of 10,000 men, fewer than 1,000 remained, shell-shocked and starving and frostbitten and scarcely able to stand. The battle they had just won had been for the Japanese the most desperate of the whole war a victory that they believe had required divine intervention. At the same time, however, it's also a defeat. For it's clear now, with the Chinese army present, that hanging on to even a small corner of southern Korea will be a struggle. Three weeks later, on March 3, 1598, several daimyo commanders sent a letter to Hideyoshi requesting permission to consolidate their positions in Korea and withdraw a portion of their men. Hideyoshi initially refuses. He doesn't want to lose face, to appear to be retreating because of the attack on Tosan. Eventually, however, he will reconsider. His armies in Korea are no longer living off the land, as he planned. Supporting them from Japan is now costing a great deal. Hideyoshi is also not eager to take on the Chinese army, which will no doubt resume its offensive sooner or later. 
he has already accomplished his purpose of punishing the Koreans. So why sacrifice more of his men and risk losing future battles? And there was something else. Hideyoshi was dying, and he knew it. He wrote of his failing health in his letters that summer, making comments like, I have not eaten for fifteen days, and I am in distress. My illness has become worse and worse, and I feel I am gradually weakening. As he felt his life force slipping away, Hideyoshi worried increasingly about his only son and heir, Hideyori, who was still only five years old. To ensure Hideyori's survival, Hideyoshi insisted that his senior daimyo, the so-called Five Regents, sign an oath swearing to serve the little boy just as they served him. All five of the regents signed, including Tokugawa Ieyasu. But it was just a piece of paper and didn't give Hideyoshi much comfort. He had another oath drawn up and had the five regents sign it again. On June 26, 1598, Hideyoshi sent orders to Korea recalling half his forces back to Japan. This would reduce the number of troops there to just under 65,000. Three months later, on September 18th, he died. One of his final commands was for the war in Korea to be ended and for all remaining Japanese troops to return home. Toyotomi Hideyoshi, the architect of the Imjin War, is now dead. The war itself, however, isn't finished. In the next episode, we're going to see how the rest of the story played out and how it ended for Korea's Supreme Naval Commander, Lee Sun Shin. Stay tuned. <laughs>